Is this frequency open? Is this frequency open? CQ, 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 WX0, MIK, Whiskey X-Ray 0, Mike India Kilo. CQ, 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 WX0, MIK. Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Mike Wills Podcast. This is the Dog Days of Podcasting edition for August 24th. No, 25th? 25th, 2019. What, five, six days left? Awesome. Um, So I am WX0MIK and um, my name is Mike Wills. It's my show. So um, we are going through the amateur... Technician License Manual, uh, 4th edition, that's good through June 30th, 2022. You know, I say that, I'm not sure you understand why. Uh, Every five years, they update these books. So this book is good for five years, and then every five, and so um, General License was just renewed this year. Amateur Extra License will be renewed next year in June, and then two-year break, and then, then it starts all over again. So, but we are going to continue on with chapter 8.3, interference. So, interference is caused by noise and by signals. Um, Noise interference is caused by natural sources, thunderstorms, atmospheric static is referred as QRN. Yay, more Q codes. (laughs) Uh, Or by signals unintentionally radiated by appliances, industrial equipment, and computer equipment. Uh, Really just about anything. Uh, Interference from nearby signals, or QRM, is part of the price of frequency flexibility. If hands operated on on assigned and evenly spaced channels, there would be much less interference. The channels would be frequently overloaded. So, I mean, think about this. You're free to do just about anything that you, any frequency, any channel that you want. So thus, you're bound to bump into each other once in a while. And so really what they're kind of talking about this chapter is how to handle that. So the next next part here is harmful and willful interference. If a transmission seriously degrades, obstructs, or repeatedly interrupts communications of regular service, that's considered harmful interference. Um, so I actually watched a video on, what was it? The Modern Rogue, where, um, Josh from, uh, Ham Radio Crash Course, HRCC, Ham Radio Crash Course, he was doing a demonstration of, um, emailing over high frequency and he was taught and he like, was listening to this whistling and I couldn't, I could barely hear it through the recording, but they were saying, yeah, that some people purposefully on this email service will inter cause interference because they don't think that it really should be on hand radio. And so people will willfully interfere with this transmission, even though it's allowed on demands, at least as of this time. So this email service requires like a proprietary um, modem type thing. And while anyone can buy it, it's not open source and it's not, you know, it's expensive. So that's why I think some people don't really like it. But it's really cool because you can email non-amateurs on the radio. It's kind of neat. Willful interference then is there purposefully trying to disrupt these signals. Uh, You have a lot more accidental interference, and those are, they're going to happen all the time. Let's say you and a buddy are are talking on the radio. Maybe you waited a minute or so because you're, he walked away for a second, that you're going to continue your conversation. Um, Someone else bumps in and starts calling CQ, 
They're like, oh, I'm sorry, buddy. We're on, we're on this band. Uh, we just took a break for one second to do something. And generally what it should be is, oh, I'm sorry. Let me, uh, move, I'll, I'll find a different frequency then. Some people are jerks and you'll have that in anything. They're just say, oh, screw you. I have my net at this time on this this channel. You will have to move. And then they just continue off their thing. That is willful. Inter- that goes into willful interference. When you're doing net on, well, anything really, you need to be flexible to the point of having a backup channel or something in case there's interference. So... You will be interfered and you will cause interference. And ultimately, just kind of say, oh, sorry, let me move um, so so I don't interrupt you. And then move on. And generally, everybody will be happy. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say about that. And then 8.4 starts talking about third-party communications. So a third party is frequently used to send messages written or not on behalf of unlicensed persons or organizations. Uh, One of ham radio's oldest activities is relaying messages from station to station until a ham is able to deliver the message to the addressee. This is third party communication. So imagine this, we're in a hurricane or there's a hurricane and they want to try uh, transmit a message from ground zero to an outpost or um, uh, net control, let's just say. So this person sends it to net control. Net control then may have to pass it off to, let's just say, right cross one or something like that, and to so where the actual communication happens. So that is American Relay Radio League. Relay. <laughs> so that was kind of the initial kind of big thing radios were doing. Now, uh, it's the definitions are slightly more loose than that, but typically it's a third party communication. But let's uh, start defining, I'm reading from the book again, let's start defining the important aspects of third party communications. The entity on whose behalf the message is sent is the third party. And the control operators make the radio contact of the first and second parties. A third party can also be a recipient of a message generated by ham. A licensed amateur capable of being a control operator at either station is not a third party. Uh, The third party need not be present in either station. And the message can be taken to a ham station or ham can transmit speech from third party's telephone call over the ham radio. This is called a phone patch. So that's another thing that can be do is you can do hook it up to your phone system and actually make a phone call. Um, the communication can be pictures, word, data, images, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, third party may participate in transmitting or receiving the message. An unlicensed person in your station sends third when they speak in the microphones and Morse code or type on a keyboard. So you could have them do that, and there's still a third party. Um, communication. Um, letting an unlicensed neighbor make contact under your supervision is a third party communication, or your daughter, or your wife, something like that, or spouse, <laughs> significant other, whatever. They can talk on the radio, and that is considered third party communications. You need to stay there while they are talking, and then you are responsible for anything they say on, on there. Uh, they also met, uh, talk a little bit about third-party agreements. And they have a little bit of a table. I'm sure it's partially out of date now. But the United States has third-party agreements with the following nations. And they lit- list off a lot of different places, all based on call sign. So let's just, um, they don't even have Canada listening. Oh, yeah, they do. Canada. So, like, Canada, Australia, uh, Barboda, Barbuda, Argentina, Costa Rica, Cuba, Haiti, Honduras, Jamaica, Mexico, Philippines, Peru, Venezuela, 
And I believe, yeah, the ARRL maintains a current third-party agreement list online as well. So the book is not going to be up to date, obviously, because this is based on time of printing. If you go to the ARRL, you can get the current third-party agreement list online. And the book tells you about where to find that. Um, 8.5 is remote and automatic operation. So many stations such as repeaters and beacons operate without human control operator present to perform control functions. It also becoming common to operate a station via a link over the internet or phone lines. These two types of operation specifically defined in the rules, but the requirement remains the same. The station must be operated in compliance with the rules, no matter where the control point is located. So they have a couple definitions here. Local control is the operator who is physically present at the transmitter. This is the situation for nearly all amateur radio stations, including mobile. Any type of station can be locally controlled. Remote operation, a control point is located away from the transmitter. And the control operator adjusts or operates the transmitter indirectly via some sort of control link. So I mentioned that three about $2,000 HF radio, you are remote operating that, or you cannot remote operate that. Actually, technically, in order to use it, you're remote operating because you're not physically moving knobs on the <laughs> radio, even if you're under your, at your own house. Um, any station can be remotely controlled. So that's, if the, well, and the, by that mean is if radio is capable, you can remote control it. Automatic operation, a stage re operates completely under the control of devices and pr procedures that ensure compliance with FCC rules. A control operator is still required, but not needed to be at the control point when the station is transmitting. So repeaters, beacons, and space stations are allowed to be automatically controlled. Digipeaters that relay messages such as APRS for the network are also automatically controlled. Uh, no matter what type of radio is asserted, local, remote, and automatic, the station must operate within the FCC rules at all times. Repeater owners must install necessary equipment for and procedures for automatic control that ensures the repeater operates in compliance with the rules. If it's in violation, it must um, basically be shut down until it can be rectified. Uh, another thing that they talk about here is... Let's see here. I don't remember if it's here or not. Um, but if, uh, it, who, in essence, let's just say I am not following the rules and I'm, let's just say, <laughs> selling my house over the radio, <clears throat> that's conducting business and you're not supposed to do that. While... I am not allowed to do that. I am responsible, even if it's over a repeater, and I'm not the control operator, I'm responsible for that transmission. However, if the control operator knowingly allows you to do that, now they are also responsible for that transmission. And they're also supposed to technically shut me down because I'm illegally using the system. So kind of think about that too is there are a lot of different responsibilities within this whole network of people and in some cases you may have to shut someone down or tell them no you gotta stop or you will no longer be allowed on this repeater and I'm not sure how you block someone per se but you know it's kind of one of those things of you gotta kind of watch it a little bit so while you're not responsible all the time for what goes on happens on your repeater, you are responsible for what happens on your repeater if you knowingly allow it. And you got to prove the FCC. You, you didn't know what was happening at the time. Yeah, I think we'll call it there for tonight. And we'll move on to prohibited transmissions, which we actually talk about more of the business stuff uh, tom tomorrow. So until then, I will um, thank you so much for listening and uh, through my chaos of um, trying to get caught up here and just in general, the whole 
budget book process I have every year at, at this time. So um, I will talk to you tomorrow. And until then, this is WX0MIK. And the frequency is now clear. The frequency is clear. WX0MIK73.